Good morning, everybody. It is 7 o'clock. You are very welcome to join us on The Breakfast Show here on Sky News, live from Waterloo Station this morning, whether it's trains, planes or automobiles. Millions of us have had to change our plans this week due to the biggest rail strike in a generation that started this morning. There's also flight cancellations and backage uh, backlogs at airports and petrol prices at a record high, pricing some people out of their cars, all making travel very hard indeed. If that wasn't enough, there's the impending threat of other public sector strikes. As I said, we're here at Waterloo Station, which is a ghost town today, with the war of words continuing between the government and the rail union. On today's show, we'll speak to both the Transport Secretary Grant Shapps will join us very shortly. We'll also speak to the Secretary General of the RMT Union, that's Mick Lynch. And will any Labour MPs join the picket line? It has been suggested they will. We'll ask the Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Pat McFadden. We'll also talk to the boss of Ryanair, Michael O'Leary, about the current crisis at our, uh, at our airports. It's the longest day, Tuesday, the 21st of June. Too high demands on pay, the Prime Minister's words as he accuses the unions of harming the people they claim to be helping by going ahead with the biggest rail strike in a generation. I'm at Leeds Railway Station where there's an RMT picket line. Um, the government says these striking workers need to compromise. They say they want guaranteed job security first. I'm live at Cardiff Station here in Wales, where more than a thousand train services are cancelled today. Most of the country completely cut off. You know, the current cost of living, we know that you need to get paid, but at the same time, don't hold the public ransom. If they feel they need to strike, that's their business, and I support them. A warning of a knock-on effect on the roads with increased traffic. We're going to keep you updated from the National Traffic Operations Centre here in Birmingham. Bags of trouble at the airports too, with one in ten flights cancelled here at Heathrow yesterday. So sorry about what's happening today. Good morning. Welcome to Waterloo Station as the biggest rail strike in a generation gets underway. This is one of the country's busiest transport hubs, but things very different today. As you can see, uh, tens of thousands of rail workers on strike. And so really, it's empty and it's replicated right around the country. The Prime Minister says the unions are harming the very people they claim to be helping. And as further strikes potentially loom from other public sector workers, such as nurses and teachers, Boris Johnson says too high demands on pay will make it difficult to end the current challenges that families are facing with the rising cost of living. The rail union in turn threatening that the dispute could drag on for months and months. These are the scenes around central London. Just 4,500 trains are running out of a normal 20,000. We're expecting an awful lot of people, as you can see, on the roads trying to get to work, trying to get themselves back on their feet after two years of COVID issues. And then if we look at what's happening with the train stations, all of those trains, there's a, a metropolitan um, uh, London underground strike, I should say, London metro strike uh, today. So uh, 24 hour strike. So all of those trains lined up as well. These uh, live from our Skycopter this morning. And throughout the show, we'll keep you up to date uh, with all the very latest travel information for train travel around the UK and which services are running and when. There aren't very many, but we will try and tell you what is going on. We'll also talk to our correspondents, as you can see, around the UK. Gerard Tubb is at a picket line at a Leeds station. <clears throat> Excuse me, Dan Whitehead is at, at Cardiff Central Station. The impact of the strikes on uh, Wales, pretty much cutting it off from England. In addition to that, if you can afford to fill up your car to travel, we'll be looking at the impact on roads. Becky Johnson is at the Birmingham National Control Centre. And then Maddy is standing by for us uh, with chaos, cancellations and delays continuing at the airport. She's at Heathrow this morning. 
Grant Shapps, Transport Secretary, is with us. Not a very rosy picture, is it, Mr Shapps? It isn't, and very unnecessary as well when it comes to these um, strikes. I, uh, you know, I hear the unions say that it's about pay. I hear they say it's about job cuts. In fact, there's a pay offer on the table, uh, and the job cuts are, by and large, voluntary. Um, so it's unnecessary. It's taking us um, back to the bad old days of, of, uh, of union strikes. And, uh, you know, it, they've walked away now from the negotiations yesterday saying that they were going to strike and uh, calling off any chance of a resolution. What are you going to do about it? Well, we're going to have to push on with these reforms anyway. The, the railways run in many ways based on rules which were put in place in, for example, the 1950s and haven't much moved on. So they're not run in the interests of passengers. There are all sorts of very, very restrictive practices uh, which carry on. And, for example, uh, timesheets with network rail have to be filled out in many cases manually rather than on computers. And you know, th that kind of modernisation, the types of things which prevent uh, modernisation in, in the way that the railways are... Uh, upkept, uh, the upkeep of the railways. Those things have to change and uh, we're going to push on with that in any case. And I see that Network Rail uh, have written to the unions last night uh, to say that since they've come to the end of the road and the, the unions have gone on strike, uh, some of these changes will now need to be uh, implemented. Yeah, my point is, what are you going to do about the strike? Well, the strikes this week are uh, a reality. They, they, they've, they've called these three days of, of strikes. Uh, they, that's, what we'll do in future, though, is make sure that we've uh, put some additional protections in place for the travelling public, uh, for example, through uh, minimum service levels, which is something that we included in our manifesto. That would mean that on a day like today, a certain level of service would still have to be uh, uh, run, uh, and through changes to allow for transferable workers. That's a much quicker change that we can make. Uh, and that means that somebody who works, for example, for the railway companies at the moment or for network rail uh, could switch uh, to, uh, for example, uh, carry out another role for which they're fully qualified and trained and provide more flexibility on our railways. So there are, there are things that we're going to do uh, to push ahead, even though we don't seem to have the cooperation of the unions at the moment. But as ever, uh, we want the unions to uh, come and, and resolve these. these. These talks have been going on for a long time and there's I'll simply back, no yeah. reason come for back to, to that strike in a sec. today. OK, come back to that in a sec. It, we need to be information rich because people want to know what's going on. So are you saying that you are changing the law and you're also bringing in agency workers so this won't be a problem later on in the week? Not quite. No, that's not right. Um, nothing that we can do this week would change the reality for the strikes this week. D law changes take time. Uh, we've always hoped not to have to change the law because uh, we've been talking to the unions for a long time uh, over a, a package of reforms, about 20 different areas of reform uh, with network rail. Uh, and as always hoped, we wouldn't need to get to this point. Uh, but for future strikes, uh, both in, the, uh, in, in this current uh, strike, but also uh, for other strikes, uh, we're going to ensure that the, the law is firmly on the passenger side, on the consumer side, when it's not a rail strike. How? How are you going well, to do that? Well, one of the ways is through that transferable skills or agency workers, as you, as you call it. Uh, another is through providing minimum um, service levels. And there are a number of other technical changes that we can make uh, to union laws to make sure that the public is always protected. I don't think it's acceptable that yeah. people who've perhaps waited for two years to get a hospital appointment today may not be able to get to it. That kids who are doing their GCSEs and A-levels this week, 17 uh, yeah. Yeah. public exams they won't be able to get to in some cases. It's not acceptable to disrupt businesses that are just getting back on their feet. And so we are going to take steps to make sure that this type of thing uh, is, uh, you know, less damaging in the future for people. OK, but how, how, how are you going to do that, Minister? Uh, well, st specifically changes through secondary legislation and through primary legislation, which means passing laws in Parliament. OK, and what's the law going to say? Well, the, you, you mentioned about the uh, agency or transferable uh, workers. Uh, that's a law at the moment. That, for example, if you have a, a, a somebody who works at a, at a terminal in a uh, operations centre at Network Rail uh, and is fully qualified to work at the next terminal, at the moment there isn't the flexibility for that person to be asked, oh, actually, for this afternoon, 
can you man this terminal over here? Uh, it would provide that okay. kind of flexibility that you'd have in any other business. This is, this is the sort of, these are the sort of working practices that have uh, developed and been allowed to continue on our railways uh, because we've got quite militant unions that we're having to work with, calling strikes on an unnecessary basis, telling their workers uh, that there was no pay rise being offered when, in fact, the pay freeze from coronavirus had already come to an end, and thanking people who had dished out £600 per family, 16 billion pounds of taxpayers' money by going on strike, the first opportunity that they've had. OK. What, why aren't you rolling up your sleeves and getting round the table with the unions this week so that we won't have another two strikes? Well, the employers are the people to be round the table with the unions. They have done. They've, they've met with them on 60-plus separate occasions, 6-0. Uh, separate occasions. It's always the employers and the unions who have to come to a settlement in these things. They're the ones with the technical details. They're the ones who uh, the, wh wh who actually have the mandate to do the settlement as well. So, uh, you know, it's always the case. It's the employers and the unions who get together on these things. Yeah, but am I not right in saying that the government is the only shareholder in Network Rail? Uh, it belongs to the government. The government sets its funding. Um, you are involved, whether you say you are or not. You're the transport secretary. It's your responsibility to keep the country running. Why aren't you rolling up your sleeves and sorting it out? Well, if, I, if I thought there was a, even a one in a million chance that my uh, being in the room would uh, help sort it out, then I'd be there. Uh, network uh, uh, Mick Lynch, who's the uh, head of, uh, of the union, the RMT, um, said last month that he would never negotiate, in his words, with the Tory uh, government. Uh, in fact, uh, government, of course, in every single uh, public strike is, of course, ultimately, uh, it, uh, ultimately um, the, the, you know, the, pay, the, the paymaster behind it. But we set a remit, and it's for the employers to uh, make the negotiated um, settlement. And it wouldn't help. In fact, it would actually undermine the process for ministers to walk in the room. Uh, looking back at every strike that I can see in the past, including... Why? Well, I was going to say, looking back at every strike, because these are highly technical negotiations, they involve 20 plus areas of reform uh, which are required, which are extremely technical, uh, and that needs the employer and the union to decide. And I'd say this is a bit of a red herring. Uh, you're saying it because the unions and Labour have suddenly got together and said, why aren't ministers in the room? I should remind them that when there were firefighter strikes under Blair and the unions were calling for ministers to be in, uh, in the room, uh, it remained with the employers. When there were strikes by the post office workers under Brown and Labour uh, were asked to be in the room, the ministers were asked to be in the room, uh, the then Labour government said uh, that of course it has to be settled via the employers okay. and the union. So it's Labour. standard, it's Labour. standard practice. You. Yes, indeed, but it's standard practice. I'm just pointing out that there is no role for ministers okay. to directly walk into I think what you're asking for is for me to go back to the sort of the bad old days of the 1970s where the, the then no, uh, Labour Prime not. Minister Harold Wilson had beer and sandwiches with them in, in, in Downing Street and it did not work out well. I do not think that that is the way forward in well, industrial It's not working out very relations. well today either, is it? Not uh, for, yeah, are, are you not saying for it's too, No, no, Mr. Shapps, I, Mr. Shapps, are you saying it's too technical for you to get involved? I'm saying the employers are the people with the mandate. They're the people who need to settle it, Kate. OK, but, but you are the Transport Secretary. You represent the government. In other words, ergo, you represent the travelling public. And they, uh, for the rest of this week, are going to be basically at a standstill. As you said, people could die as a result of these strikes. You need to roll your sleeves up. You need to get in that uh, meeting room with the unions and you need to sort this out, is what my viewers will be shouting at their tellies this morning. Well, as I've tried to explain to you several times, uh, that is not the way that industrial disputes are resolved. They never have been since the days of beer and sandwiches at number 10 in the 1970s, uh, and it didn't work out very well then. The way that res res disputes uh, need to be resolved are always between the employer and the employees, the unions themselves. As I said, the unions have called a strike under a false pretense. There was always going to be a pay offer on the table. Uh, they took their members out to strike, uh, telling them that there wouldn't be by balloting in April before uh, the pay freeze would have been unfrozen uh, nationally. Uh, we've got yep. a completely unnecessary and very, very damaging um, strike. They are hurting precisely the people that they claim to be protecting because 
white collar workers who can simply stay at home, use their computers, log in by Zooms or Teams will carry on as before. The people they're hurting are yep. people who physically need to turn out up for work, maybe on lower pay, perhaps the cleaners in hospitals and the rest. And it's very damaging of these unions. I absolutely deplore what yep. they're doing today. And uh, there okay. is no excuse for taking people out on strike under false pretenses. And that is exactly what they're okay. doing. OK, just because you've explained it to me several times, Mr Sharp, doesn't mean that your point is necessarily valid. I go back to the point that the government is the only shareholder in Network Rail. It belongs to the government. The government sets its funding. How can you claim not to be involved and not to want to be involved and, and not being able to get involved when that is the exact point? You should be speaking to the unions, you should be getting around the table and you should be sorting out this mess. Your country has come to a standstill and it's your responsibility. I, I understand that you want us to go back to the 70s and beer and sandwiches with unions and ministers negotiating oh, direct. It's just, not, it's just not how it works. Come okay. on. It's just not how how it works. Uh, it, it, if, you, if you're Honestly. saying that every time there is a dispute, uh, that what's required is for ministers to personally go and negotiate the resolution, uh, then why hasn't that happened when there was a junior doctor's dispute? Why didn't it happen when there was a firefighter's dispute? Why didn't it happen uh, with uh, other disputes, including, for example, when the post office uh, workers went on strike? You know as well as I do, the employers are the people with the mandate. The employers are the ones with the technical uh, details to negotiate this. This is a stunt, which I'm afraid you're falling for, by the unions and the Labour Party. The Labour Party who won't even condemn these strikes today, and the unions who only okay. last month were saying, they would not negotiate with the government and have suddenly decided, uh, running out of uh, things to say, that they'll suddenly call on ministers to uh, talk to them uh, and walk in the room with them directly. It wouldn't resolve anything. Okay. In fact, it would make matters worse, okay. and that's why I'm not in the room. OK. You keep banging on about the 1970s. Uh, we look as though we're heading towards a summer of discontent. Uh, hearing from the Prime Minister that he doesn't want inflation busting pay rises. As a result of that, we're hearing that even criminal barristers are thinking about going on strike. We're hearing that nurses are thinking about going on strike, doctors are thinking about going on strike, care workers are thinking of going on strike, teachers are thinking of going on strike. Who is it that's taking us back to the 1970s? Well, we're clearly having a, a, a difficult time along with the rest of the world with inflation right now. Uh, it's a global phenomenon after coronavirus exacerbated by Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Everyone's going through the same thing. I don't uh, think we'll end up there, and I very much hope we won't. And in particular, in the area that I know best on these uh, rail strikes, there's no need for it because there are so many reforms that are required uh, that would make the railway much more modern and run in favour of the passenger that in return for those, we can pay a pay increase. And unlike the message from the unions in this particular dispute, uh, we most likely don't need to make compulsory job cuts. For the most part, this will come through voluntary. In fact, we've already had more people come for, through voluntarily uh, than we could accept. Uh, to leave the, the, the railways. Um, so, uh, you know, the, these, these are strikes being called under false pretenses. I hope that in other areas, which I'll know about in less detail, uh, we don't get to strikes as well. And I think after the, the whole country, I mentioned the £16 billion we put into uh, protecting the railway. It's been the same across the economy. That's £160,000 per rail employee. I don't think it's a way to thank people for their uh, for, for their hard-earned cash going into supporting the railway by then immediately calling a strike as we try to recover from coronavirus. Just before I let you go, just to clarify, you're saying that if you were in the room with the unions, it would make matters worse. Is that what you're saying? It's a stunt by the unions who uh, could settle this today. They've had a pay offer. Uh, they know that these reforms, which they've been resisting for decades, need to go ahead. These work practices that prevent us from running uh, a railway seven days a week, from treating Sundays like uh, any other working day, for example, are long, long overdue. Uh, railway uh, workers are fortunately well paid. The medium salary is 44,000. The, the average salary for a train driver is 59,000 pounds. That compares with 31. 1,000 for a nurse. And the government has to make uh, that overall uh, choice of balancing pay across the public sector. Fortunately, railway workers have been well paid. It's at time to get this strike settled. And I do call on the unions to come back to the negotiating table and fix this thing. OK, robust defences as always. Uh, I appreciate that you've got a challenging day ahead of you, Mr Shapps. We appreciate you starting it with us here on Sky. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot. Tomorrow's here.
Hi. Thoughts? Morning, Kay. Well, Grant Shapps and the government, they're very bullish in facing down this strike. They say it's harming the people that it's intended to help. Uh, they say that it's on false pretenses because the unions have been made a pay offer. What might that offer be? Well, Mick Lynch of the RMT union says that uh, they turn down what is effectively a 3% pay rise, 2% no strings, plus another 1% uh, linked to productivity. There are some reports that they may have been offered something even higher. They say that they want more than that because their members are grappling, like everybody else's, uh, with the rising cost of living. I think the question going forward for the government is, yes, they can say uh, this is all the union's fault and that it would achieve nothing by them getting around the table with the unions if they're Actually, not willing it would to... Them, them. It would hinder them. They say it would, uh, it would, it would achieve nothing um, if they are not willing to, in the government's view, be reasonable because they say high pay rises only fuel higher inflation. But what mess Message does that send to the wider public sector, to teachers, nurses, um, other transport workers who um, are not on strike today but may go on strike uh, later in the year, if they are facing inflation 9% now, um, scheduled to, to reach 11%, and they're only being offered um, a 3% pay rise in many cases after uh, many years of real terms pay cuts for many in the public sector. So, um, of course, the government can set, channel people's anger at the unions now, but, of course... I I think in, in the end, I think there's an awareness among many MPs that they, they will be looked to to try and sort this out. And thoughts of winter, of, uh, summer of discontent? Well, I don't think Grant Shapps did much to dampen that down. He, he said, look, things, things are going to be tough. The government's message is that public sector workers um, do a very tough job. They do. Uh, the, the people like uh, railway workers work very hard throughout the pandemic, even during the first lockdown, and that a pay rise is there. They're not being offered nothing, but they're urging them to take um, what the government say is reasonable. But the transport workers, including Mick Lynch there, you can just see uh, in our pictures, um, have said is not enough. And the picket line, of course, that we can Indeed. see. Indeed, La Labour behind. front benches, we're told, have been banned from going on the picket line, although the union leaders have been saying that Labour should be supporting uh, the workers in their struggle to get higher pay. Interesting what Grant Shapps was saying about changing the law. Yes. And, and also bringing in... Um, it won't affect the... It won't impact on the threat and strikes this week, but going forward, we're going to have agency workers and the law is going to be changed that pe so that people can be moved around the stations to do different jobs. That's right, and it's being pointed out that even in the 70s, uh, during, of course, Margaret Thatcher's... Uh, uh, the previous government's struggles with the, uh, the miners and Margaret Thatcher's struggles with the miners in the 80s, this was never done, agency workers, because there was a fear that they may be attacked on their way in. Grant Chaps and the government have made clear they're going to tweak the law this week to enable um, some agency workers to do some of the work. Now, of course, you've got 50,000 people on strike today. A lot of those jobs cannot be done by agency workers. They won't have the right training. But the idea is that agency workers may be able to provide a basic service, and uh, that would be a real, um, a real sort of crossing of a line. Many okay. people think in terms of uh, the government's approach uh, to strikes. It won't help this week, of course, but the idea is that it could help it later in the year. Okay, it's 7:22. If you're getting the 7:30 to Southampton from uh, here at Waterloo, it is running. So hurry up and you can get on that train. Uh, looking uh, closer at the situation uh, about what's happening around the country, though, for you now. And the first of three rail strikes planned for this week is now underway. The, uh, the others are due to take place on Thursday and also on Saturday. The strikes are affecting services across England, Scotland and Wales. And people are being told to work from home if they possibly can. Among others, Avanti West Coast and GWR say trains will run on a limited service. Southeastern Railway and West Midlands Railway are also just two of the lines that will be running a reduced service. At Waterloo, South Western Railway plans to run two trains an hour to Southampton and Basingstoke and four trains every hour from Waterloo to Windsor and Woking. The last uh, London Northeastern Railway trains are all scheduled to depart before 4pm. In the north of England... Uh, Trans Pennine Express and Northern Rail have warned of significant disruption and Mersey Rail will have no train or replacement bus services on strike days. In Scotland, no trains will run north of Glasgow and Edinburgh on strike days with just two trains per hour running between the two cities. 
and the vast majority of services in Wales will also come to a halt. To get the latest travel updates on all train lines, visit National Rail Enquiries online and follow the Sky News travel blog and on mobile. We're also having hourly updates here on Sky News. Now, throughout the show, we'll be looking at the impact of the rail strikes on real people trying to make ends meet and talking to those striking about why they're doing it and bringing you the latest travel information. As we said, I'm here at Waterloo Station and we have reporters at major transport hubs for you. Gerard Tubb is at a picket line at Leeds Station. Uh, Dan Whitehead is at Cardiff Central Station. The impact of the strike on Wales is pretty much cutting it off from England. If you can afford to fill up your car to travel, we'll be looking at the impact on the roads too. Becky Johnson is at the Birmingham National Control Centre. And then chaos cancellations and delays continuing as the airports uh, continue to struggle. Maddie is at Heathrow. Let's start with Gerard, should we? Uh, Gerard is in Leeds for us this morning. Hi, Gerard. Good morning. What's it like where you are? Well, the station's still locked, Kay. Uh, it's been locked up this morning, opens up in five minutes, uh, but it's not going to be much fun if you're trying to get anywhere in the north of England today by train. Northern Rail um, have the, the biggest, most effective blanket policy, I suppose you could say. Don't travel is their advice. Um, and they say that from now until Sunday because of the knock-on effects on the days that the strikes aren't on. Uh, Transpennine Express is uh, saying it's going to be very limited, only travel uh, if it's uh, essential. They're also pointing out that today there are a number of stations completely closed on the line across to Scarborough, um, Seema, Moulton, Scarborough itself is shut, uh, Brough Hull is closed and Yarm uh, up uh, in Teesside. Uh, and LNER, as you were saying, all those trains leaving by um, four o'clock today. Well, the last train from King's Cross to Leeds is at five past three. This really is not a day to be using rail for getting anywhere you need to be. OK, let's bring in Dan, standing by in Cardiff. Hi, Dan. Thoughts from there? Well, as you said, Kay, Wales is essentially cut off. More than a 1,000 train services across the country here cancelled uh, today. On every day throughout the strikes, 85% of services simply not running. We're at Cardiff Central Station, the main station here in the capital. Just look at the boards behind me here. Ten departure boards uh, on the uh, wall here, every single one just with the sign, industrial action, severe disruption. Trains meant to start here around 5.30 in the morning up into the valleys. So far, not a single uh, train on the boards. The situation in terms of what is running in Wales is there are meant to be uh, some services from London to Cardiff, a very limited uh, number of trains, no sign of any of those uh, yet. There is nothing west of Cardiff. But Talbot, Swansea, millions of passengers use the trains there each year. Simply nothing in or out west of Cardiff. There are no trains whatsoever in mid Wales. There are no trains at all up in North Wales. Real disruption for the people of, of Wales. Uh, if you're not in Cardiff, you are essentially uh, cut off. There are a couple, or well, they're meant to be, uh, a couple of uh, lines running up into the valleys uh, today because they are not run by Network Rail, they're run by Transport for Wales, so they don't need those staff who are striking. But essentially, pretty much every service is cancelled. We were chatting last night to the passengers uh, getting home on those last couple of trains. One of those was Ronnie Santiago, a nurse who visits her patients using the train network. She's had to make new plans to get to work today. Because there's no train at all. Tomorrow I'll have to ask my partner to take me to work. And I, I live in Cardiff and um, I'll have to go all the way to Bridgend for work tomorrow. So he'll have to take me there and then pick me up tomorrow at half a seven in the morning. So it is, it is actually affecting me. That's the situation from Ronnie, uh, who is an absolutely vital key worker, having to change her plans. What was also interesting, though, is there are a lot of people who we spoke to at the station last night not actually too bothered because, of course, the pandemic has changed the way that a lot of companies are allowing their staff to work. A lot of people working from home, given that flexibility that perhaps they weren't given before COVID-19 was around, so they can now uh, simply work from uh, home. I was chatting to some of the station staff here. As I say, they expect some trains from London, not really convinced that they're all 
going to run uh, as planned. Nothing on the departure boards. It is half past seven, and the whole of Cardiff Central uh, Station here in the capital of Wales, empty. OK, thanks a lot. Let's uh, bring in Becky. What's it like on the roads, Becky? Yeah, this is the National Hub where they monitor all the major motorways, major A roads. They've been gearing up today for traffic levels resembling those of a bank holiday getaway. That's what they were planning for. There's extra staff out and about. We've got live pictures of the roads, so I'm going to step out and show you the situation on some of the busiest roads. If you take a look at the screens behind me, on the, the top left there, that's the M25. You can see already queuing clockwise just near to the Dartford crossing. Uh, the middle screen on the top there, that's the M6. That's actually flowing pretty well just near the junction with the M5, normally quite a busy spot. And then on the top right there, you've got Spaghetti Junction just north of Birmingham. Again, flowing all right, a bit of a queue getting towards Birmingham, but that's the picture and all eyes on it really here because uh, we, were expect we were being warned of a, a surge in traffic as people uh, turned to their cars instead of trains. Let me bring in Frank Bird um, from National Highways here. Frank? Better or worse than you're expecting at this stage in the morning? Uh, at, at the moment, it's about on profile for a normal Tuesday morning, so we're quite pleased that people have heeded our advice. So normal for a Tuesday, so not the surge you're expecting. Why could that be, do we think? Um, you know, uh, we think that a lot of people have perhaps chosen to work from home. The next four days are going to be glorious, so it's maybe an opportunity to um, stay away from the office. Um, but, uh, you know, overall, we're, we're pleased that people have taken our advice. We've had um, over 100, 100 gantries warning of uh, potential uh, congestion for the, uh, since Thursday. So you know, quite a few days for people to get used to it. And thankfully, a lot of people are taking our advice. The people heeding those warnings, what about for the rest of the week? Are there any particular days you're worried about? Um, on, the, uh, on the days when there are strikes, so um, Thursday and Saturday, but obviously as well, um, rolling stock is probably going to be out of place uh, on Wednesday and Friday. So we'll be doing this operation right the way through till the weekend. All right, thanks so much for talking to us, Frank. OK, yeah, Frank's saying, actually... Pretty normal for a Tuesday morning. Could it be people are staying to work from home? Has the weather made people think they prefer to work from their gardens? Could it be petrol prices, meaning people just can't really afford to drive, even if they can't get the train? We don't know, but we will be keeping an eye on it. It could get busier later if people think that they decided to delay their journey, perhaps thinking that it would be particularly busy first thing. We'll, we'll keep you updated. OK, Becky, thanks a lot. What about getting away from it all on a train or a plane? From Heathrow, um, Maddie's there. What's it looking like there today, Maddie? Yes, yeah, so if you are hoping to fly away, um, the rail strikes will affect you too because most airport services like the Gatwick Express aren't running at all today or are running a severely reduced service like the Heathrow Express. And that will, of course, not only make it harder for holidaymakers, but also airline and airport staff trying to get to work and the tube network down as well, which takes you to Heathrow. And that's the last thing we need because there's been weeks of chaos now. And um, just over the last few days, let me remind you, two days, we've seen more queues and more delays at the airport and thousands more cancellations um, from EasyJet yesterday and at here at Heathrow. One in ten flights were cancelled after the airport asked airlines to start um, pulling back their services. So it could deal with the backlog of baggage. And we saw over the weekend Deb Payne's uh, Sky correspondent filming those mountains of baggage building up. So um, there are still problems here. And what with uh, the staff shortages at airlines and airports and the rail strikes, uh, check before you travel is the advice and probably good luck. OK, for now, thanks very much indeed. Thanks a lot. Um, just looking at the board uh, behind me and it does look as though um, all of the Southampton trains are running from uh, Waterloo this morning. So if you're hoping to get from central London to Southampton, it looks as though you can, at least for now. And it does say that they're all on time. Uh, meantime, speaking to the programme this morning, the Transport Secretary Grant Shapps, he has criticised the unions for going through with the strikes, but said it would not be helpful if the government entered into the negotiations. Mr Shapps said employers have the mandate to resolve the situation. I, I understand that you want us to go back to the 70s and beer and sandwiches with unions and ministers negotiating direct. It's just not, it's just not how it works, Kay. It's just not how it works. Uh, if, you, if you're saying that every time there is a dispute, uh, that what's required is for ministers to personally 
go and negotiate the resolution, uh, then why hasn't that happened when there was a junior doctor's dispute? Why didn't it happen when there was a firefighter's dispute? Why didn't it happen uh, with uh, other disputes, including, for example, when the post office uh, workers went on strike? You know as well as I do, the employers are the people with the mandate. The employers are the ones with the technical uh, details to negotiate this. This is a stunt, which I'm afraid you're falling for, by the unions and the Labour Party. The Labour Party who won't even condemn these strikes today, and the unions who only last month were saying they would not negotiate with the government and have suddenly decided, uh, running out of uh, things to say, that they'll suddenly call on ministers to uh, talk to them uh, and walk in the room with them directly. It wouldn't resolve anything. In fact, it would make matters worse, and that's why I'm not in the room. OK, um, so the government is not going to get involved. It would make matters worse, is what uh, Grant Shapps has said, the Transport Secretary, this morning. As a result, we are entering a week of strikes here around the UK. Uh, let's uh, put it to the Secretary-General of the RMT Union, Mick Lynch, why we found ourselves in this position. Hello to you, Mr Lynch, thank you for joining us. What an absolute mess. Well, it's a mess created by Grant Shapps and government policy. Now, we could get a solution to this dispute. Grant Shapps can come to the table if he wants. I'm not particularly bothered. But if he wants to come to the table, he'd be welcome, as long as he comes in a framework of goodwill. What he needs to do, really, is allow the management of the train operating companies and network rail the licence to get on with negotiating. At the minute, he's dictating what they say, he's dictating what they can spend, and he's dictating that they must make unreasonable changes in our industry, which includes, for instance, closing every ticket office in Britain. It includes last night's statutory notification of compulsory redundancies, 2,900 uh, on track maintenance. And it includes a pay policy that's making people all across Britain poorer. Some of our members have not had a pay rise for the third anniversary now. We can resolve that if we've got a proper negotiating framework. But the fact is that Grant Shapps, Rishi Sunak and Boris Johnson are dictating the terms of this dispute. Now, they can either facilitate a settlement or they can block one. At the moment, they're blocking one. They're telling lies constantly. They've just told another lie uh, that I've heard on your programme that we've refused to negotiate. I have met every single transport minister that's relevant to my industries. The rail minister, the bus minister, the maritime minister about issues. We will meet with government ministers any time, night or day, as long as they come to the table in a constructive approach. OK, but you say that. And you say that Grant Shapps would be welcome at the table, but you're also quoted as saying um, that you wouldn't be seen dead negotiating with a Tory government. So which one is it? Well, I should, that's just nonsense. That's, I don't know where you got that from, uh, whether you've seen me say that. That has just been made up by the Tory press office and is being regurgitated by various media outlets. I meet with them all of the time. I've met Grant Shapps. I've met all, met all of those ministers. We will talk to anyone that's got a, a constructive input into the dispute or has got influence over a settlement. Why do you think Grant Shapps would tell us on Sky that uh, he said, that you said, that he said, that you wouldn't be seen dead meeting with a Tory government? Why would he say that if you hadn't said it? I have no idea. You'd have to ask him. You might want to ask Grant Shapps why he's used pseudonyms in the past to cover up his identity. I don't know what's well, motivating that's a Tory different... ministers. Oh, come on, come on, come on. But I do know, but I do know that they have a, a strange relationship with the truth including in Parliament and on the record and on the media. OK, talk to me about what your message is uh, to the travelling public today. Some who are children who will be missing their exams could well have an impact on their future. Some of them who need to get back to work having two years of COVID. And some people who could be going to hospital appointments, potentially having surgery, won't be able to do that and could die as a result of these strikes. Well, I think it'd be dramatic that railway workers that are going to make uh, hospital wow. patients die. We have to give statutory notice uh, of two weeks before we take industrial action. Preparations can be made. We've taken four weeks since the ballot mandate was returned, and we've been available to negotiate a settlement all through that time, as we are today and as we were up till half seven, eight o'clock last night. My message to the travelling public is that we're very sorry for the disruption that's been caused. We don't want to do that. We want to get a settlement to this dispute. But like everyone else, many members of the travelling public are suffering from the austerity imposed by the government, both in the private sector and the public sector. Uh, profits are rampant. 
uh, dividends are up, shares are up. The only people that aren't making any money at the moment are working people around Britain who are struggling. They're struggling in full-time work, taking state benefits, and some of them are having to use food banks. We need to get a settlement to that. And the British worker needs a pay rise, they need job security, decent conditions, and a square deal in general. If we can get that, we won't have to have the disruption in the British economy that we've got now, and which may develop across the summer. What would be your uh, advice to other unions who are potentially uh, considering ballot action, uh, balloting for strike action uh, as well? Would you support them in that? My advice to the unions is to campaign on the issues. And ultimately, if the government and the employers do not change their direction, I believe that more ballots for strike action are inevitable and more action is inevitable. And what I would say to trade union leaders and trade union activists is we need to coordinate and synchronise our campaigning so that we can rebalance uh, the inequalities in our society. I think I'm knocking at an open door on that because the trade union leaders across the TUC and across Britain are telling me that they want to join this campaign. We had a massive rally on Saturday uh, on these issues. Working people are crying out for leadership and direction. The Labour Party can contribute to that, but it's going to be the trade unions that make the difference in this uh, equation at the moment. What do you mean by synchronising? Well, we need to coordinate the action. So we need mass rallies, we need people on the streets, we need protests in every town uh, and city in Britain. And if we have to have industrial action, we should coordinate <laughs> that industrial action so that it has the most effect possible. Um, we heard from David Blunkett, a Labour politician previously, as you know, previously in the Cabinet. He said, you, your union, are taking us back to the 1970s. Well, he's, he's talking nonsense. He's out of touch and he doesn't know what he's talking about. I started work in the 1970s. But you're talking about coordinating you strike there. action by... Yeah, but you're talking about coordinating strike action with a number of unions bringing the country to a halt. No, I'm talking about coordinating strike action so that we get effective campaigning so that British workers can get a square deal off corporate Britain, <laughs> who are raking in the profits. Uh, the problem with inflation in this country is people profiteering. So if we can get a deal with all of these companies, we won't have to have strike action. It's because we've been too passive over the last decade or so that workers have found themselves exploited. It's because of the lack of action and the lack of coordination. That's why British workers are suffering. It's why companies can take advantage. It's why we've got fire and rehire right across this economy. But we've got outsourcing and precarious work. So it's obvious that we need coordinated but Mr. Lynch, action because we need to rebalance society. Yeah, but Mr Lynch, the whole point of coordinated action would be, I'm guessing, to bring the country to a halt. Otherwise, why would you do it? No, no the point of coordinated action is to get an effective negotiating uh, position at the table with the employers. You don't, I don't know what it is you're suggesting. Are you saying that workers should passively accept the reduction in wages, the stripping out of terms and conditions, extended hours and precarious employment? If we want a stable society where people can guarantee their jobs, where they can look to progress themselves uh, in our society, then we need strong trade unions. It seems to me that all the, all the media want to do is spout Tory lines, oh, that everything it. that the trade unions stop do it. is destructive. It's be, we've got the five-day week, we've got public holidays, we've got holiday agreements, we've got pensions, we've got women's rights, we've got uh, equalities laws, all because of what the trade unions do and have done through our history. We have been the mo most progressive yeah. and democratic force in this society and we intend to continue to do that. OK. Mr Lynch, I would also hope that you'd be able to have a robust discussion without name-calling, but there we are. Tell me how much you're asking for as a union. What pay rise do you want? Well, I'll negotiate that with the employers. You know the figures. The, 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 the network rail figure at the time it should have been settled was 7.1. I'm telling you, if you let me finish. The network rail figure well, in December should have been 7.1 and the train operating companies was between 7 and 8. We'll negotiate on that. There's lots of ways to put value into a package and we'll deal with the employers on that basis. What would you accept? Well, I'm not going to discuss that with you. I'll discuss that with the people at the negotiating table. I don't, dis I don't negotiate on the street 
with a media presenter? Because you, you're not the person negotiating with me, so I'll deal with the employers on that. Well, uh, negotiations are not going very well, are they? And I think the British public wants to know what's going on. So I'm asking you what the union would accept. Well, I'm not going to deal with that with you. I will deal with the employers. We negotiate with them. It's not very respectful to the employers if we're trying to put, put together a package that's not just about money, it's about the conditions that our members serve under and it's about their futures and it's about the redundancies that we're faced within this industry. That will all form part of a package and a negotiated settlement. So I'll deal with them on that and I won't attempt to negotiate standing on the pavement at Euston. Well, I would have thought you'd be happy to negotiate anywhere as long as you manage to sort this out for your members. How much have you been offered? Well, well, well can, can I... You know what we've been offered. If you read the press releases, we've been offered 2% uh, by all of the companies and there's a further 1% available if we accept all of the conditions, including the redundancies and the stripping back of uh, conditions of service. And that's not acceptable to our people. I don't know what you've been offered, which is why I asked you, because um, according to some of this, uh, this morning's papers, you've been offered 3% plus another 1% if uh, other guidelines are met. So is it 2% or 3% that you've been offered as a baseline? It's 2% we've been offered as a baseline by both sets of companies. OK, thank you for clarifying that. What writing. would your advice be to... Thank you. I'm glad you clarified it. I'm just putting it to you that uh, other people are suggesting otherwise, and you're the man who in the know, so I'm glad you clarified that for me. What's your advice to RMT members uh, on picket lines if agency staff were going to try to get through that picket line? Well, there aren't any agency staff. There's, you can see behind me, there's no agency staff available. Agency staff can't carry out the work of my members. They're highly skilled, safety-critical workers working in engineering, railway operations, signalling high-speed trains, complicated setups. There are no agency workers available that can replace our members. This is one of the myths that Grant Shapps is perpetuating because he has problems with reality, I think, sometimes. There are no agency workers coming here to work today. There is a complete lockdown of the railway on London Underground. And the only people that are working are managers that have been trained up in a couple of hours to take this forward. As it happens, the managers' union is balloting from yesterday as well because they're facing exactly the same problems. So we think the problems on the railway are going to escalate. Uh, Aslef are going to be balloting soon. I think Unite are going to ballot. So the problems are getting worse and worse. And so the government has got to, to deal with that. But there are no agency workers here. There's nobody crossing our picket line. And our Not today, Mr Lynch, but there might be. From the north of Scotland sure, to the south I understand. of Cornwall. I understand that, Mr Lynch, and that's certainly the case today. But, you know, will it still be the case if, after this week, you still get nowhere with the negotiations? The government is saying that they are going to bring in agency workers. My question to you is, I'm guessing that your, some of your members will still stay on the picket lines. What will they do if agency workers try to cross those picket lines? Well, we will picket them. What do you think we'll do? We run a picket line and we'll ask them not to go to work. Do you not know how a picket what line works? What do they do anyway? I very much know how a picket line works. I'm much older than I look, uh, Mr Lynch. Uh, what, will we, what will picketing involve? Well, you can see what picketing involves. I can't believe this line of questioning. Picketing is standing outside the workplace to try and encourage people who want to go to work not to go to work. What else do you think it involves? And what if they want... Well, I just wondered what else it might involve, because I very well remember uh, the picket well, lines where, of the 1980s, where are you going with your... Mr Lynch. I'm asking you which what your members you would about? do, Mr which, Lynch. Which picket lines are you talking uh, the about? Minor the minor strike. Minor strike. Yeah. What does it look like, the minor strike? <laughs> What no, are it you doesn't, Mr about? Lynch, and I'm just asking, I'm just to clarify... I'm just trying to clarify... Uh, no, Mr what Lynch, and I'm about? sorry if you feel the need to ridicule me, but I'm just asking you what you expect your members no, to your do... your questions if are, are, are workers... verging into the nonsense. I'm we asking pick you... pick it as effectively no, as we can. And what does that involve? <laughs> Look, there it is. That's what it involves. So you won't stop it. You won't stop agency workers crossing the picket line. We will try to stop agency workers crossing the picket line by asking them not to go to work. What is it you're suggesting we will and if do? They... I'm just asking you. I'm trying to clarify. 
for the benefit of the British public Clar who are being stopped from travelling what? around the country, Mr Lynch. I'm just trying to clarify exactly what, what your members you're trying are doing. To clarify? Ask politely. I'm, I, thank you for... Uh, I'm, I'm replying to you, to you politely. ...to answer the question. What we will... OK, Mr Lynch. What we, I've answered I'm the question about you. six times. If there okay, are people trying to cross to my the line, so I'm asking we ask them again. not to cross I'm it. Asking, <laughs> I'm asking questions on behalf of my viewers this morning, Mr Lynch. I'm very sorry if you find it offensive. Well, you the seem to have got is, lost in your questions, it workers, seems to me. No, I haven't. I, well, perhaps I could just ask it just once more, see how you feel about it. If agency workers want oh. to cross the picket lines so that people can go about their work and their business and travel around the country, your members will ask them not to cross. If they continue to want to cross, then you will allow them to do so. Yes or no? We won't allow them to do so. It's up to them whether they do so or not. We will ask them under the laws of this land, not to cross the picket line and not to be strike breakers. But if, if agency workers think they can go into a signalling centre or operate a train, they're going to have a bit of a problem, aren't they? So what do you think these agency workers are going to do when they report and have crossed the picket line? They're not trained um, to do the work. I'm not sure, uh, because it's, it's probably not, illegal my, for not them, my area of expertise. It's probably illegal for them to attempt to um, do just it. Just one final question well, before I let you go, because I know that. you've got a very busy day. You've got a very busy day ahead of you, so let me just ask you one final question. If the three strikes of this week do not amount to uh, a 7.1% pay rise offer being offered to your members, uh, will you go on strike again? Yes, we will go on strike again if we don't get a settlement to the, to the issues. So after this phase of action, we will review the situation, we will look at where the negotiating position is, we'll continue to talk to the companies at every opportunity, and if we need to take in further industrial action, that's what we'll do. It's an absolute pleasure to talk to you, Mr Lynch, this morning. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Um, hopefully we can chat in person sometime very soon. Thank you. Uh, Tamara's here. Hi, Tamara. Hi, Kay. Um, what an interview. Um, <laughs> the RMT say that their members have not had a pay rise in three years. They also point out that, um, you know, their, their argument is that the government are planning a wave of compulsory redundancies that they say that has not been ruled out, although Grant Shapp says they'll all be voluntary, and they're worried about ticket offices closing, about the safety uh, implications of having uh, fewer workers, and that they want to take a stand. And I thought he was um, tacitly encouraging others to do so too. He said was. other public sector unions uh, should be campaigning on the issues. So um, the idea of a summer of discontent uh, really being raised there, I think, if, okay. if others follow suit. OK, uh, let's bring in Chief Exec of Ryanair, Michael O'Leary. Very different problem for you, uh, Mr O'Leary, but nevertheless, huge problems uh, with the airlines. What's the situation this morning? Good morning, Kay. Uh, enjoyed your last interview. Well done. The uh, situation is not huge chaos. Uh, there are, is undoubtedly problems, particularly at a number of UK airports, most notably Manchester, Heathrow and Gatwick, uh, where the, either the airport security or the baggage handling providers are short-staffed. That is causing pinch points, but it's important to keep some context here. 90-95% of all flights are getting away. They are delayed by ATC and airport and handling delays, but they are getting away. People are getting to their destinations. Some airlines are cancelling a small proportion of their flights between 5 and 10%, which is deeply regrettable. But this is one of the, uh, the byproducts of the struggle to recover smoothly from uh, two years of COVID lockdowns and government mismanagement over there. Uh, we spoke to uh, the government minister yesterday. You say it's to do with Brexit. He says that's absolute nonsense. It's not. It's completely to do with Brexit. I mean, an awful lot of these pinch points would be uh, resolved very quickly and very rapidly if we could bring in European workers to do the jobs that, frankly, people in the UK are not applying for and don't want to do. Uh, this has always been the way the UK has uh, provided our uh, manned and staffed its transport industry, uh, uh, and it is the way forward. If, the, and if we can't uh, uh, attract people to do those jobs, like baggage handling, like security at the airports, we're going to have to bring in workers, whether it's from Ireland or from uh, continental Europe, to do them. And Brexit is one of the big bugbears in the system. It has introduced enormous uh, labour market inflexibility in the UK. And there are hundreds of thousands of jobs in the UK that, frankly, British workers don't want to do. Um, OK. How long do you see the problem continuing for? 
I think this problem is uh, going to continue, particularly at those airports like Gatwick and Heathrow, right throughout the summer. I mean, it will be worse at weekends. It will be better during the week. Uh, there are less problems at airports like Stansted. Ryanair is operating a full schedule. We're fully staffed with pilots and cabin crew. But even we last weekend suffered 24% of our flights were delayed by air traffic control delays. Another 15% of flights were delayed by airport and handling uh, delays. So I think it is going to be a struggle through the summer. The airlines, uh, the UK airlines, BA, EasyJet, TUI, Ryanair and others, we will get 90, 95% of, well, Ryanair, we get nearly 100% of our people to their destinations, albeit with delays, but it will be a less than satisfactory experience and this problem will not be resolved until we start uh, allowing European workers to come in and do the jobs that, frankly, UK people no longer wish to do. The government says it's the airline industry's fault, nothing to do with them. They gave you loads of money during COVID. It's the government's response to everything. Look, this government couldn't run a sweet shop. Uh, I think in Grant Shapps has ably demonstrated that this morning. The airlines, Ryanair, we're fully staffed. We're not cancelling any flights. We expect to run a full schedule. In fact, we added 200 extra flights yesterday for the remainder of June and the early part of July to rescue passengers whose flights have been disrupted by cancellations being made by other airlines. Uh, and the, the problem here is not one of the airlines making. You've had this government, we've been locked up for two years, they introduced their bogus traffic light system that never made any sense and never worked during COVID. Just as we were emerging out of COVID with the Omicron variant and we were locked down again over Christmas, as we emerge out of Christmas, we're beginning to recruit again and then the Russia invades Ukraine. And the, the problem here, the, the government believes the problem is the airlines. Look, the airlines want to fly passengers to their destinations. In Ryanair's case, we're fully staffed up. Stansted and many of our other airports in the UK are doing a great job. But we are hidebound and hamstrung by a government okay. that is so desperate to show that Brexit has been a success when it's been an abject failure, will not allow okay. us to bring in European workers to do these jobs. Out of time, Mr Leary. Good to talk to you as always. Thank Good you for joining you, us on the programme. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. Thanks very much indeed. If you've only just uh, joined us, my goodness me, have you missed some testy interviews this morning. The government minister accusing me of uh, wanting to take the government, uh, the country back into the 1970s. And I can't even begin to tell you what the unions were saying. Stay tuned and find out.